Hi, and welcome to the Heart Leader Podcast, where heart and mind align. I am your host, Amber, and I am here today with Tracy Pryor. She is the founder of Earth and Cup with her amazing spouse and partner, Michael Poole, who you met on a previous podcast. Tracy agreed to be with us today because she is an amazing and inspiring heart leader who has taken the time to devote her entire life to this mission. She is an ordained pastor who received her doctorate in this very field. Her entire focus is on building the internal focus and self-drive to have the reverence to know how to take this out into the world. And she's done this by focusing on other areas of study as well, including the Eastern philosophies included in Vedic and yoga and Tai Chi. She has such a wealth of knowledge to share with us today. So I'm going to take time now to turn to her so she can share this knowledge with us and our community and how she blends this so brilliantly together through Earth and Cup in order to help so many in this really, really interesting time in our world. So Tracy, I really appreciate you taking time today to come on and share all of this wisdom that you have with us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's great to be a part of what you're doing and, and the work that's going out into the world. Absolutely. We were just talking about all of the studies that you had done in your doctorate, and it was mind-blowing. I didn't even know this about you. So if you're willing, I would like to start there because it is about making difficult decisions sometimes and how to build ego since our focus this month is around balancing the ego or really just aligning the ego when we have to make challenging decisions as parents as leaders of a congregation as leaders of anything whether it's even our own lives sometimes we have to take that step back and put our ego in check and make those decisions and you spent your entire doctorate focusing on this can you enlighten us? Yeah, yeah there's like, there's like so much in there at <laughs> once. Um, so you, you know, the other really important thing in that is to be clear on who we are um, and to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others and make the best decisions that, that we can make. Um, because so many times we can um, take in information that clouds our discernment and makes it difficult for us to make decisions. And we really have to know who we are and what we value and use that as our, our guiding principle, really listening to that inner wisdom and knowledge that we all have, that divine in us, that allows us to make a clear decision and one that's for the best of those around us. Um, not just ourselves, our you know family, but for the community. and. In my doctoral program, I did a project where parents had talked about wanting to keep their kids safe. And of course, we all want to keep our children safe, but there are certain limits to that. And life is going to happen. Um, COVID is going to happen. And we have very little control over you know, um, that situation. We can always control what we can and let go of the rest. But in the midst of that, how do we give our kids what they need, um, giving ourselves what we need to make the best decisions, um, to be resilient, to stay true to who they are and, um, and just not you know, allow their perceptions to become distorted by all the noise that's happening around them. Yeah. That's, that keeps them safe, right? That allows them to come back to who they are and to move forward from a place of ease and security and grounding. Yeah. And when we're talking about raising our kids and helping them understand how to have a healthy sense of self and a healthy ego, if we're constantly attempting to protect them from the world, are we able to give them that? Yeah. It's a balance, isn't it? That's yeah. balancing that, um, 
that our own ego, I guess, but balancing that sense of wanting to protect them and yet allowing them to have their own experiences and to learn from, from those experiences, helping them process what's happening so that they can begin to make their own decisions and discern what's right for them, teaching them how we make those decisions. Um, that was, we were talking about that just a minute ago about discernment and how we make decisions that are, um, that feel right and true, that you know, don't make us feel yucky inside, but that feel solid and grounded and true to our values. Mm -hmm. And what did you find in your research? Are there any tips or tools or things that you came to? I know we're both parents, so like anything that could help even me in that flow, I would welcome the insight. Yeah, I think, you know, some of the marks of resilience, it's been written a lot about, and a lot of people have been talking about that in the last year and a half, two years. Um, how do we find resilience? And, you know, it, it's being authentic, um, trusting ourselves, building relationships of trust, finding connect, places of connection and belonging where we can be authentic and have some practice in being authentic so that when we go out into the world, um, we're comfortable in our own skin and we feel confident, self-empowered um, to, to be who we are in the world. I think that's really important and it's kind of um, foundational. And then um, that support system, right? Connection, belonging, um, faith, spirituality also is a resource for people and can be a guiding principle if we know what we value, what we believe, and that can help guide us and, and help keep us grounded and centered. This episode of the Heart Leader Podcast was brought to you by Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas is one of the nation's leading boutique search and interim resources firms and has been recognized as a leader in identifying and providing access to top talent for clients since 1984. Whether it's a company preparing to go to the next level or a candidate looking for better opportunities, Stephen Douglas keeps the focus on the needs of the people they serve. They specialize in connecting the right talent to a company's needs while also understanding what the market demands. To learn more about this amazing organization, visit them at stephendouglas.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, sometimes even that's the hardest part though, right? It's like we've been told for so long, growing up as a child who you have a parent who desires to protect you in a very crazy and chaotic world. And so you grow up being protected and you lose your sense of identity through that protection. So how do you even begin to know who you are when you grew up not knowing who you are? Mm. So there are those foundational steps, like where do I even start? How do I even take that first step? And I know having looked at many of your resources through Earth and Cup, you have many of those, you have many points of entry for someone to walk in and feel comfortable, whether that's through faith, through multiple points of faith, or through self-care. Can you talk to us about some of those and how you came upon that, giving them, okay, I'm going to meet you where you are, and then help you see what else is available? Yeah, I can just give you my own personal journey. So I found um, myself Oh, over 10 years ago, um, I had practiced yoga earlier in my life and I found it helpful, found it um, you know, physically helpful. Most of us, that's where we enter into um, yoga or Tai Chi. It's for the physical benefits, the exercise, the flexibility, the strengthening. And I found myself needing really more, um, more in my spiritual life. And, and I, started incorporating my prayer life. And um, I would add that into movement. And I found myself meditating more, um, finding more silence and stillness, found that, that just calmed my whole body down and allowed me to be present in a way that 
um, a way that was helpful. <laughs> Um, and it just calmed, it, you know, calmed my nervous system, calmed my body down and allowed me to access that even when I was in a challenging situation. So, um, I started that journey incorporating my prayer life in with my movement and that developed over a period of time. And then really when COVID hit, um, it was like, oh, we're back there again. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I had started learning about, I mean, you know, as you go through your yoga trainings, you, you learn about self dinacharya, self-care, daily habits, all those things. Um, but I was finding myself, I really need to start putting these into practice. Um, and, and one thing I discovered, I just started drinking water. It sounds so simple, but I would drink water. Um, and I added the lemon and, and added the hot water and and it changed my life. <laughs> Just yeah. drinking water. It sounds insane, but, but I did. I, I, um, I'm now, I, you know, I try to drink at least a thermos a day, two thermoses sometimes. Um, but that tells me how dehydrated I am. And what I realized was that all of, um, some digestive issues that I had in my twenties, my early thirties, um, a lot of that I think was just really related to being, having a dysregulated system, not knowing how to deal with stress. And, um, and having a regular daily practice of hydration, I, I'm like, I think I was dehydrated for a long time and just didn't really, you know, I wasn't really aware of it. And now um, that's been helpful. And as well as the, you know, self-massage, um, again, it sounds really simple and easy, but I start my yoga students on Wednesday mornings Every time we get ready for our final relaxation in class, I'm like, okay, get out your massage oil or your lotion. Um, massage oil is better, but you know, use what you have. And I and I we just have a hand massage. And I teach them how to do a hand massage. And um, some of the brave, you know, I invite them to do foot massage. Uh, haven't had many takers on that over <laughs> years we've been doing it. But for myself, I try to do that before I go to sleep at night. Um, it's just. I don't know. And as I've started doing it, it it's grounding, it's centering. Um, it helps me sleep better. And um, my whole body just um, finds more calm and ease. Um, you know, Ayurveda recommends tongue scraping, um, food and nutrition, your plant, more plant-based diet. And that depends on the seasons, eating seasonal vegetables. You know, there's just, there's so many wonderful, wonderful things that we can do that are easy to access. And it helps build resilience in our body, helps us take care of ourselves so that we can be present um, with those around us. Yeah. 100%. And I know we had talked about breath mm -hmm. and how important breath is just like water. Yeah. We forget that everything works better when it's hydrated. Like if your car runs out of oil, you're not going to get very far. No, right. And that's, that water is a lubrication for all of our joints, um, for just the fluid of, you know, everything moving in the body and the brain. Um, everything works better when we're properly hydrated. And I think so many people don't realize they're just not getting the right kind of hydration. So um, that's one of the first things that I get up in the morning and I do that. And then, um, you know, then my breath practice and meditation. Yeah. It's the same with airflow and, you know, hydration doesn't include like coffee because coffee actually dehydrates us. Right. Yes. Right. So yeah. every, I've had so many people say, but I drink five cups of coffee a day. And I'm like, eh, well, good for you. You're well caffeinated. Doesn't mean you're well hydrated. So these are things that you know, you begin to learn throughout the process. But then yeah. when you started talking about the breath work, it's the same as bringing in the right amount of air through the car, right? Has to have the right airflow. It's the same for us. Have to have the right flow of air. And you had mentioned like three very prominent breath practices that you use. Can you talk to us about that and how it helps align, helps even align ego, but align the body and bring in the whole mental vital through the body? Yeah, it's so important when we find ourselves in a stressful situation or, a, or just where we have to make a decision. 
Um, and, and there's a lot going through our mind and to calm the mind, to calm the body, there's just a really simple breath and it's called heart focused breathing. So I would invite us just to sit up nice and tall and we're going to experience it. And then I'll talk about it a little bit more and we'll build on that technique. So sitting up nice and tall, letting the sitting bones ground down into our chair or into the floor and lengthening through the crown of the head. Just relax the shoulders and we're gonna bring awareness to our heart. And if we wanna close the eyes, feel free to do that or we can soften the gaze, allowing the jaw to relax and imagine breathing in and out in the area of the heart. Breathing in and out from the chest area. Breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. Finding an easy rhythm that's comfortable. As we practice this heart-focused breathing, we may notice the stress level in our body, lowering, we may find a clarity of mind as we continue to focus on the area of our heart. Letting go of distractions. And now let's bring to mind someone or something we appreciate. A feeling of gratitude. Just making a sincere attempt to experience a positive feeling of appreciation or care for someone or something in your life. And if the mind wanders, that's okay. Bring it back to that positive experience, that positive feeling we have or someone or something in this moment. It might be a loved one or a pet, an accomplishment. Focus on that feeling of calm and ease. And whenever we're ready, we can open the eyes, come back into the space, be aware of the room around us. So the first part of that breath was just simply heart-focused breathing. And that's something we can access in a moment in a stressful situation to activate immediate calm in the body. As we take that deep breath, we're stimulating the vagus nerve, which is telling the whole body that we're safe, we're okay, and we don't need to respond to a threat. It gives us that pause to kind of step back from the situation and what, what's going on and be able to respond in a helpful way or even get a clear direction on what we need to say next. And then the second part of that, the second step was to activate that positive emotion. And that might not be something that we can do in the moment when we're face to face um, with you know, a conflict or a challenge, um, but that's something we can practice at home, activating that positive regenerative feeling so that it begins to build resilience in the nervous system. And it helps us to more easily and quickly activate that 
feeling of ease. It was beautiful. Is that something that you feel okay with us like clipping out of this podcast and just making available for our listeners so they can just keep going back to it over and over again? Absolutely. Yes. The third step of that breath is to then radiate that positive feeling out beyond our own body, but to begin to feel, um, and that's kind of a third more advanced step, if you will, but to take that um, positive emotion, that positive experience, and then begin to radiate that out to others and, in, in, you know, kind of um, send it out into the universe. So you just kind of become this giant radiator of love. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Just like a pulsating um, aura of um, ever increasing positive emotion and love and acceptance and wholeheartedness. Yeah, for sure. Giant walking hearts everywhere. Can't argue with that. No. Whole purpose of being a heart leader, right? You're just walking around being a heart. You have love. You have love. You have love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it's really, I mean, being a leader, um, it can be challenging and you often have to make really difficult decisions and you're not going to be able to please anyone. And and you've got to be able to step back from the current situation and go, okay, what's happening here? And what do I need to be aware of? What am I not seeing that I need to see? Um, You know, what kind of clarity can I get on this situation? And this breath allows us to do that. It allows us to to take a step back. And as we breathe, as we get that, you know, the values open and we're breathing in and we're breathing out, eliminating, we can let go of the perspectives that aren't helpful. We can take in what we need to see and we can recognize if we've been doing our daily habits, we've been, um, you know, cleansing the body and drinking water and hydrating and meditating, we'll be able to respond and with clarity and, um, and make the decisions we need to make to move forward from a position of ease rather than anxiousness and anxiety and fear. We don't make good decisions when we're afraid, when we're stuck in a, a cycle of fear. Um, we just don't, we're not thinking clearly and it's very difficult to make the right decisions for ourselves, for our families. But if we can use this breath at home, at work, in our relationships with one another, you know, maybe it's a difficult phone call we have to make and we're anxious about it. This breath can help us settle into the moment and be prepared for that conversation. Um, it helps you be a lot less reactive. Yes. And that is key because how many times do we end up saying something we don't intend in a reactive moment? Yeah. This can save our behinds from that yeah right and talking about being in positions of leadership you have found yourself there many times especially in a field that can sometimes it is a very open and loving field but there are definite steps that you have to take in that field And bringing in Eastern philosophy into a very Western approach or very Western mindset that isn't always welcoming of that. It takes someone with a lot of heart and a lot of willingness to step outside of what's being thrown at you or pushed back to continue to say, okay, I understand where you are. How do I navigate through that with you and help you see? that there is more than one way. How did you find yourself when you did get pushback around bringing Eastern philosophies into a very um, apprehensive philosophy? How did you navigate that? If I can ask you that personal question. Yeah, I, well, and I think um, anytime you're bringing in some kind of new idea or change, um, you know, we will find areas of resistance, right? Um, so it's how do we kind of move through that? Um, 
and I think in and of just m- me, who I am, um, I, you know, I was an art major and then I ended up teaching science for a little while. And then <laughs> I ended up in seminary going into ministry and people were like, that's so different. And how do you, you know, bring all of that together? And for me, it wasn't, it was seamless. Um, for me, it was looking for the unity rather than the separateness. Yeah. Um, it's finding, you know, what is it that holds us together? What is it that's similar about all of these things? And, um, and I see them springing. I mean, I just see them not as two sides of a coin, but as part of a whole. And they each have gifts for the other. Um, so when I'm talking with people about well, you know, how can you bring this into the church? And, you know, what is it that you really believe in? Are you a true believer? <laughs> or, you know, all kinds of crazy comments um, that, that I hear, my, you know, Mike hears, and we have to respond to. And, and I invite people to think about just their own lived experience. And, um, you know, is your faith just in your head? No, it's not. Your faith is, you know, in your whole body. It's a lived experience. And, you know, where, where are your first memories of God, the divine? You know, um, let's go back there. And what were they? You know, um, was it a solitary experience? Was it an experience with other people? What were the sights? You know, what were the things around you, the smells, the feeling that you got in your body? Where did you feel that in your body? And when we begin to have that kind of a conversation, it's like, so your mind and your body and your spirit are all connected and they influence one another. And what's happening in your body, this physical ailment or whatever, um, you know, how does it affect the rest of your life? And how is it affecting your mind, your thoughts, um, your habits? And how does it impact your faith? Which, which is ultimately, you know, um, the question of spiritual direction. It's where is God in this? So we're always asking that question. And I find that when people can get to that place where they can begin to see that and hold those tensions together, um, they don't see it as being so separate or so different or, you, you know, strange um, or intolerable. And once they experience that for themselves in their body, then they're, you know, um, I don't know. They just, they, they really feel it. They get it. <laughs> they can get it for themselves. I don't, I don't know if that was um, the answer you were looking for, but that's kind of um, how it's happened for, for me. It's, it's having that conversation. Um, if someone isn't willing to sit down and have the conversation, then that's okay. Um, they can believe what they can continue to believe what they need to believe or what they feel led to believe what's right for them. And that's okay. Um, and yeah, but I love that you didn't make it about you. Like it's not a personal slight on you. If someone is willing or isn't willing, you're just providing the information. And I feel like that's a key part of being a leader too. It's like, I can guide you to anything that you're asking for, but I can't force you to accept it or reject it. That's your choice at that point. And so you have done that flawlessly. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt sometimes. I I can't speak for you, but I know sometimes it does hurt, but it doesn't mean that it's a personal slight. It's a choice of each individual. But at the same time, you're right. This is something that's felt by each individual too. Mm-hmm. So if they're not feeling it, then what can you do? And I think that's part of being authentic as a leader as well. You know, that's that um, being who we are and knowing who we are and um, being able to share that in an authentic way. So this is you know, no, this is really who I am. And it's okay if you don't like that. But um, for me, this deepens my life, my faith, um, and has, you know, been a path um, 
for leadership. Yeah. And I invite you to join me in that and we'll move and we'll breathe together. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and it, there's so much in, um, in the Christian tradition for centering prayer. So I go back to that, you know, I'm like for years, you know, there's been centering prayer that invites us to slow down, to be aware of where the divine is in creation, to be aware of the divine presence within us and within others. So it's not a new idea at all. Um, it's just something that we get um, so hooked into other ideas about what success is or other ideas about what faith should be that we sometimes forget um, what it has been all along and that, you know, what even the teachings of Jesus invite us to um, open ourselves to seeing, you know, hope and peace and love in one another. Yeah to seeing the commonalities mm -hmm. while we honor the difference. That's right. the key. So now you had also mentioned how you saw everything so integrated and blended together that it's just multiple ways up the same mountain, right? And I know that when I talked to your amazing husband, we talked about the same thing. And we do, again, we get so focused on, no, this is my path. That's your path. You mm -hmm. stay on your path. I'm going to stay on my path. But what you did is you said, nope, I'm going to walk partway up this way. Then I'm going to hop. <laughs> I'm going to take a little tour here. Then I'm going to jump over to this one. And I'm going to take a little tour here. How do you feel all of that just like enhanced your ability to meet the people that you're in service to? where they are. I mean, you just had such a diverse plethora of experience when you started reaching out to these people. Do you feel like that gave you an opportunity to have better connection points with a wider variety of people? Yeah, I think so. I, it's, it, you know, <laughs> um, I started out working with youth and then I transitioned to working with you know, adults who, you know, we're all just little children, right? Um, and, and I think that the diverse background helps me kind of relate to different people, bringing in science, bringing in art, bringing in music, bringing in all of those things. And I, um, you know, you want to meet people where, where they are and with what they've got going on and, um, and you know, backgrounds, we've done a few things with domestic violence shelters and other places and, and being able to be authentically in those spaces and um, with all kinds of people is what's important. Yeah, especially people who are healing. Yeah. If they can't relate to you, then they can't talk to you. Right. If you don't seem real um, or if you present, you know, this um, project a sense of success that's unattainable or that they think is unattainable or um, in some way that it's just it's unaccessible for, you know, for folks to go there sometimes. So trying to um, I tend not to use a lot of Sanskrit. So when I need to use Sanskrit, I'm like, oh, OK, I have to go look that up, you know, when I'm writing. <laughs> Or, or doing something else in a situation um, where I need that. Um, I know it and I've got it, but in my everyday classes with um, the folks I serve, I, you know, it makes it unaccessible for them. And they're like, what does that mean? And what, you know, and they just um, can't go there. And I'm like, just breathe, focus on your heart, you know? Um, and, you know, we don't need to talk about the, you know, the atom or uh, atman or the you know <laughs> atman and brahman <laughs> and, and, uh, and all of that yeah. you know, let's, just, let's just calm the mind right and um and seek to open up our perceptions and and as we do that you know um 
I can invite them into that energy flow. And, and they might not know what a value is. They might not know what a chakra is, <laughs> but they know that when they sit down in class or when they sit down at home and they start to do the practices and they start to breathe, that they feel better in their body. And they're able to connect um, to their true self, to their authentic self. They're able to be, feel self-empowered and um, yeah. Yeah. And find that balance. That's a big thing that COVID really did open up for many of us. And it doesn't matter what stage of life you're in, what your income level is, it like leveled the playing field. All of us were looking for a way to be healthier, to be more internally connected or connected with family, just connected somehow because we felt how disconnected we were at some level as we're all sitting in isolation, like put it right in our face, right? And so for individuals like you and others that I've talked to, to begin to take this into a form where it could be accessible to everyone, where it wasn't that your ego was so strong that it had to be, oh no, it has to only say that yoga is the alignment of Atman and Brahman. Well, yes, that is true and it will always remain true, but the average person sitting in their home, that's not what their focus is going to be. It's going to be, what is in this for me? And how can I feel better using the pranayam? And they don't even necessarily care that it's called pranayam. They want to know what steps do I have to take? Now, once I'm through this, I might be interested in learning all of that, but help me get through this first. Yeah. And so I honor you so greatly for taking the time to make it accessible to people that it might not have ever been on their list to even consider in the first place. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that I invite people to do when they're, you know, and that's chanting. Um, so like you just take a simple word or phrase, you know, and that, that repetition um, you know, we know that in Christian church, we might sing a song, right? But break it down. Um, take a very short word or phrase. It might be a favorite scripture. It might be an affirmation, it, you know, but begin to just say that over and over to yourself with the breath. And it's, it's really calming. Um, what I like to use is, you know, breathing in, me and thee breathing out the and me, or I guess I did backwards. <laughs> <laughs> breathing, in, breathing in the and me, right? We're taking that in, exhaling out me and the, and whatever your, you know, the is, however you imagine the divine, um, but that inflow and outflow of the breath with that heart focused breathing, um, You know, over time, just that simple practice, people ask, how can I meditate more? How can I add something else into my really busy schedule? How can I, you know, fit in exercise? I mean, just, you know, it's really simple to take one minute, two minutes. And while you're waiting for your coffee to perk in the morning or your water to heat up, breathe. You know, flow side to side. Do something in that two minute time frame that'll help recenter and refocus you for the rest of your day. Yeah. We think it has to be, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes of something extreme and um, it, it doesn't, you know, start, start small, build in those little incremental things and build them onto things we already do. Brushing our teeth <laughs> in the morning making our coffee. Yeah. Austin calls it the French fry approach. Like if you might think that having one or two fries isn't a very big deal, but if you do that every couple hours, eventually you notice it adds to your waistline. Mm -hmm. So if you do the same thing with a positive thing, like every couple hours, take one or two minutes to do something positive for yourself, 
imagine what that does for your mental waistline. Like it pumps you up. Yeah, absolutely. So it really does. And, and cumulatively, then if, you know, if you're doing that, I mean, if you were to stop to think about that, if you were to stop every hour and you're just taking one or two minutes to do a heart focused breath, over 24 hours, you know, or well, you're not, you're sleeping some of that, but over your 12 hour day, let's say to that becomes, you know, 24 minutes. Yeah. So you've done a full meditation yeah. by the yeah. end of your day. Yeah, absolutely. And it, that is accessible. That is it, so accessible. Yeah. And it's exciting. I mean, and to see someone, um, that's where I get excited is to see someone go, Oh, Okay. I can be person. I can become a person who exercises every day. I can become a person who reads sacred texts every day and meditates on them. I can become a person who journals every day, or I can become a person who meditates. I can become a person who has a breath practice. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Yeah. And that helps you take care of yourself. That's self care. That's building resilience. That's going to help you be a leader in your home, in your relationships, and at work, everywhere you go. You, you know, you're a leader everywhere, every day, and we have that opportunity to make an impact. And so where do you want to make an impact today? I love that. It's a great question to start out with, too, because it gives you that sense of direction. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and that's that balancing ego, too, right? Um, you know, my day is about me and I can think about all the things that happened to me in that day. <laughs> but um, when I take it out of that and begin to think about, okay, well, you know, did I have an impact on someone else today? Yeah. What did I do that made an impact for someone else? And um, if I start out my day with that question and I end my day with that question, I'm making the world a better place a little bit at a time. Yeah. So talking about the, the pandemic, mm-hmm. that it seems maybe we're starting to balance out, speaking of balancing things, we're balancing out a little bit from, <laughs> but I know that especially with churches, there was a little, no, I can't say a little bit, there was a lot of an impact when it came to how churches navigated through that. Did you feel any impact? in the congregations that you served or is there any insight or anything that you can share around that? Because I know where I live, there were a lot of churches that did not make it. A lot of congregations that completely pulled out and churches closed. They weren't able to make the transition to an online platform. And it's really heartbreaking because for many people, that was their sense of community. That was where they went to feel supported. And then suddenly the pandemic comes in and not only do they have to stay in their homes and their fear sets in, but then the community that was there for them that gave them that sense of safety is just gone. Mm -hmm. So did you have any experience like that in your congregation or anything you could share? Yeah. Um, when the pandemic started, we were in New York City and serving on Staten Island. Um, there was you know, a real heightened concern for gathering in public spaces. And um, we decided kind of right away to move to an online platform. And there was some resistance between which platform we should choose and which direction we should go. It was really important to me to have a platform where people could connect. Um, and connect more um, in an integrated way than was possible through streaming. And that's not to take away from anyone who streamed or did something else. Um, It's just the choice that we made because of the way that our worship was structured and the needs of our community. We had, um, you know, people who couldn't come in who were a regular part of our worship and they didn't feel safe doing that. So we went to Zoom and we had our worship via Zoom, which has its own challenges <laughs> and trying to get everyone integrated onto that platform. Um, 
you know, not everyone could, uh, could do that. Some called in and they did that for a while. So it presented its own challenge, but it allowed us to have a more integrated worship experience where we could have someone in another place providing music. And then I would be at the church center um, kind of leading things there and, and hosting the Zoom meeting. And then we would have someone else in another location who would be able to you know, lead prayers. So <laughs> it was a group effort. And um, we did that for a really long time um, in that those early days. And then we tried to find ways to, um, to drop off. You know, we had a whole core of leaders who would drop off bulletins or who would drop off um, you know, different things so that people could participate. We dropped off um, elements for the sacrament and you know, things like that. So people could kind of share. That was the way that we chose to do it as a group. And it, um, we did that until we were able to open in, in September later that year, and then um, tried to have a hybrid that was much more challenging. <laughs> <laughs> so one way or the other was easier. Hybrid, not so easy. Right, right. It brought its own unique things. Um, trying just the technology aspect of it, we needed to upgrade. And we tried to, to do that. And, and um, so that everyone could participate and that those who were online would then have a sense of who was in the sanctuary, who was present um, and not just see me up front. But, you know, it, it was really important for me that people be able to participate um, in the worship service as they were accustomed to doing and also have that interaction with one another before and after to be able to check in, um, to note who was there or not there and be able to call them throughout the week or send them a card. And um, that was really important to us and, and to me as well. And then in the midst of COVID, I, we moved, I moved to um, Ohio and um, the church here wasn't able to really have anything in person. So they hadn't met since November of the previous year when they had had their last services and then decided not to have Christmas Eve. And, um, and it had been several months of, of, you know, of not meeting when I came. And then, so just, it was really important to me, let's meet in person because we could at that point. Um, let's meet in person. Let's find a way to do that safely because you haven't seen each other and you haven't been together. So, you know, finding that sense of connection and belonging, um, coming back and ways to do that safely um, was what became the focus in my new congregation. What was it like the first time the congregation got back together? I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, exciting. Little, but nervous too. We, you know, awkward. Um, it's the great awkward, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, do you, what do we do? And then we had to develop practices around that. So, how are we going to share the piece? How are we going to, um, are we going to sing, not sing? Are we going to just skip the hymns altogether? Are we going to speak them? You know, um, are we going to have special music, not have special music? Um, this is a congregation that loves music. They love to sing. And so um, they're small enough and they have a big enough space. We were able to social distance. And, you know, within the first six months of us meeting regularly, we're like, okay, we think we can do this. Let's try it. And everyone was comfortable enough doing that. And, and so we did. Um, so now we're, we've, we've been singing with masks on for some time. And um, it, it, it was a big deal. It was a big deal for them. And, and just the, to be able to sing after not singing for so long and to find your voice, um, you know, singing is chanting. And we, we, you know, science tells us that when we breathe in unison, when we sing in unison, when we speak in unison, as we do in my tradition, we have these responsive prayers that are a big part of our worship experience. And when we do that, we're forming community, we're creating bonds, um, we're, you know, releasing all those positive feel good chemicals in the body, and we're connecting with each other. And so um, it's been great <laughs> yeah. to be able to do that. And um, 
you know, and even when they weren't meeting in person, they were finding ways to foster connection, um, reaching out and caring for each other and um, delivering groceries and helping and visiting folks in um, resident facilities and nursing homes and rehabilitation places, you know, so. Yeah, it's beautiful to have the community, even when it's a, when the disconnection was there, but to be able to come together and feel that and have that sense of connection because it is so much more powerful in person. It's yeah. technology is a wonderful tool and it's helpful when it's not possible to be together. But my personal opinion is there's an energy when you are together and able to do these things together that, you know, technology is a stopgap until that happens. So, and now more and more businesses are starting to come back into the office and feeling through what you just described. So being able to share what you navigated may help a business and understanding, okay, this is what we're about to face, but there is a path through it. So just keep going, keep feeling your way through it. I, absolutely. And I think recognizing it's going to feel awkward and yeah. lean into the awkward, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where, I'm like, you know, um, I think my yoga practice helps me lean into the awkward, to the uncomfortable, to the difficult, um, you know, be up for the challenge, show up, right? Show up for the challenge with your full self, with your authentic self. And, and it's okay. Um, you know, we were talking about how uh, at one of our last board meetings, how things are just different. They still remain awkward. And, um, you know, it's not like it used to be. Yeah. And just that reminder, but it is where we are now. And this may be the new normal. And that's okay. Yeah. And maybe it's not supposed to be like it used to be. Maybe it's on the verge of getting better than it right. used to be. Right. Maybe we've learned something about ourselves and about each other through this experience that will help us um, really understand the value of connection, really um, root down into what it means to belong um, and, and to be welcoming in a new way, you know, to be more aware of the needs of the other. Right. I mean, I think that this whole experience has made us so much more aware of the needs of the other if we've been willing to lean into that. Um, and I think that's something of value to carry forward. I agree. The needs of self-care, mm -hmm. uh, being healthy from within and then carrying that out to the connection and the other. So important. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough again for sharing your wisdom, your time, your personal experience, which is completely invaluable. And again, if folks would like to get a hold of you to learn more about how you integrated the Eastern philosophy into your Western practice, which I see a movement happening right now, and you've already been on the forefront of this. They can get a hold of you how? Yeah, earthandcup.org. Um, my email is tracy at earthandcup.org. You can um, also reach me through Redeemer Moravian Church, which is um, my other, where I serve also, <laughs> other, other part-time, right? So Redeemer Moravian Church in Dublin, Ohio. And um, that's redeemermoravian.org. Fantastic. We will make certain that all of those links are available for folks to check out. Is there any last bit of wisdom you would like to share with the community before we wrap up here? Just um, keep, keep breathing. Remember, remember to breathe, um, you know, be strong, be brave, show up and shine, shine bright. Yes. I love it. Mm -hmm. Be that walking heart. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for inviting me on and having this conversation. It was fun. I love it. You are an amazing heart leader out there showing others what is possible. We greatly appreciate you. 
And we appreciate all of you out there too. Thank you for tuning in and joining us on another episode of the Heart Leader Podcast where heart and mind align. Again, I am your host, Amber, and I am here with Tracy Pryor of Earth and Cup. You can catch us every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Pacific. Until the next one, we look forward to seeing you in the Suivera community. You've been listening to the Heart Leader Podcast with your host, Amber, where heart and mind align. Tune in weekly as we take a deeper dive into what it means to be a heart leader. Ready to take the next step? Join us and over 1 million people worldwide who've united in creating this global movement of love. Become a heart leader for today and tomorrow. Learn more and connect with us at suivera.org.